Hello, this is Tor from ITCOM. We were recently invited to speak at the Meta Asset Management Association of Ireland. After the presentation that we did, it was about a 45 minute presentation, we had a number of questions from the attendees. And I felt that like those questions were pretty interesting. So I want to share that snippet with you. Here it is. Love to hear some questions to comment, agreement, disagreement. I'm about 40 minutes. So um, I really appreciate it. And um, I'll leave it over to you, Jan. Tor, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. No, that, that was really good, really good. Very uh, interesting to see the difference, I suppose, between a planned job and an unplanned job. And maybe just to kick it off, I know you, you spoke about it a little bit towards the end of your talk, the, the key differences between planners and schedulers, because we, we see a lot of people hired as maintenance planners and they end up as schedulers and they really are missing a trick. Could you comment a bit on that, please? Yeah, I see that more and more. And I, I, I don't know if just um, if it's something I um, imagine or, you know, it's hard to see over time, but it's really hard to find good planners, right? Because yeah. a, a very good planner is somebody that actually has to know the job or if they don't know the job, they have to be tough enough to go out there and talk to the craftspeople and say, hey, Mr. Craftsperson, can you teach me, can you help me build this job? And then maybe positive or negative answers, right? So I see a lot of people move away from planning. It's always been like that in my career, but scheduling, scheduling is also something that becomes a little bit more of a, um, people think of it as a desk, desk uh, exercise, whereas I see it more where you have your resources and you know your skills, and to me, that's the main that the supervisor needs to be the one putting the schedule together, not necessarily the computer part of it, but they need to be the one saying this person's doing this and, and coordinating that. So I think it's very important that you first plan and then schedule. What we do in many plants, and I, I haven't been to plant in Ireland in, in many, many years, but most organizations see that we do halfway decent job scheduling it. But if we don't plan it, <laughs> we have to change the schedule because we don't have the parts, we don't have the tools, right? So yeah, I agree yeah. with you. I think that's a huge well, thing. I think one of the challenges that you'll hear a lot of people say is that we don't have uh, the approval to get a headcount. So we can't, we have basically a maintenance manager, two supervisors, we have mechanical, electrical, instrument crafts, and we're not allowed to have anybody else. And what I have seen in a few places that were quite clever about it they took one of the craftsmen and that person became the planner. Even though they were still a craftsman, they just planned and they, they rotated it. And to what you just said, that that person had the inside knowledge about how to take things apart and how to put them back together again. So they were actually quite good at planning work in advance because they knew how long something was going to take, what equipment was going to be needed and what spare parts. So that might be one way out of it because I've, I've heard somebody say that, what would you prefer? Would you prefer three maintenance craftsmen or would you prefer one planner and two craftsmen who could do more work which of those teams and everybody says ah oh, the three craftsmen and in fact it's the opposite the planner and the two craftsmen will get through more work than three craftsmen with no planner yeah i agree yeah. and I, I've seen p p people do that too they do they do take a crafts person and we don't even you don't even need to call them planner i mean you can call them the queen of england for all i care as long <laughs> as they do planning right i mean you know, you don't, it doesn't matter. You don't need to be all um, advertised at all. You can say, look, guys, we need to prep our jobs. You sit down and talk to a group of eight craftspeople and say, yeah, we should plan the jobs. All right, how do we do it? Somebody want to take on it or you, you want to rotate it, take a couple of months each. What do we do here, guys? I mean, yeah. they'll be the first to tell you. So We have a question here from Niall Ohms, and he's just, I think he's alluding to one of your examples. Um, I agree with the root causes, but why was the change not captured in the change control process? If a stringent change control process was followed, the change may have been challenged by SMEs. And that may be more of a, what you would expect to see in a regulated environment in a, in a pharmaceutical plant. So what do you think of that one? Well, well, in this case, I'll just answer you how it is because they didn't have a regulated change control process. <laughs> yeah. Like you said, like in a pharmaceutical plant, they would have picked it up. This is a paper mill. We, that they just don't have that. So boom, it goes and, and that's it. You know, Should they have a chain control process? Absolutely. But otherwise a, a lot of those regulated and what I see in the regulated environments, you get a little bit more chance through those processes to push the maintenance side of things, which is great. 
Yeah, but in this case, they just didn't have the process. So otherwise, fair question. Okay, uh, a question here from Brian Murphy. And he'd like to know, could you please give some comments on how you see predictive maintenance as opposed to preventive maintenance progressing in the future? And this could be even something around, you know, maybe the industry for uh, impact on the maintenance world. Yeah, no, I, I mean, the, the I, so I work quite a bit with a couple of companies that really goes into the, the predictive maintenance using artificial intelligence, like I alluded to a little bit here. And of course, that's going to be huge because you start seeing a more dynamic. I mean, if you want to simplify it, and, and again, I'm not the expert in, in AI, but with machine learning, you don't just see um, two limits, right? But you learn. So you see the pumps now pumping 22 gallons per minute. Well, then these things are happening. And then all of a sudden you start seeing things on the process side. So the companies I've been working with that do this, you see the integration between operations and maintenance. So just yeah. to give you a, a practical example, there was a pump cavity and you couldn't figure out why all of a sudden they have AI in there and they see, oh, it's because of that pump that's half a mile down the road when that gets down to this level and the AI saw it immediately, right? And then it was quite obvious for these guys too, they would have caught it eventually. But I see that the, the predictive maintenance is getting really advanced more by learning and, and connecting the process data with the maintenance data. And I think it's more to do on the, on the process side there for the companies I work with, with process industry. We find more problems on the process side and, and where do you draw the line? Was that was that was that heat exchanger? Was that a process or was that a maintenance? I mean, take your pick, right? But we see much more around the process data that people are picking up, correcting it, so we don't get maintenance issues from that. The yeah. preventive, I think. I mean, I don't know, but I think that's just the basics and training. And I think that's where we're going to have our maintenance problems. We don't train our guys anymore. Like I said, we don't know how to tighten yeah. the bolt. We don't know what oil we should have, and the you know the basic stuff. So yeah, I think I think we're all seeing a little bit of that now as we get older. The the enthusiasm of the younger generation to go into maintenance is not quite where it should be. There's not as much desire to get your hands dirty anymore. And it's a real challenge because uh, ultimately we're going to need to replenish all of our maintenance staff at some point. So we have to try and, you know, encourage people or find a way to get them involved in maintenance and see it as a meaningful career. Okay, so we have a question here from Charles Smith. This is a good one. In the past life, I did a lot of work on gas turbines and I found that uh, the investment in condition monitoring and found that the operators had better fast Fourier analysis in their feet. <laughs> I think this is going to be a look, listen and feel <laughs> type of question. Yeah, no, no, I think, I, I mean, I think you're right. I mean, many times if you have experienced operators, you know, and this is what we're discussing. And of course the AI is the future, but I mean, why do you, if you don't have operators doing basic inspections and maintenance yeah. people doing basic inspections, I mean, don't, don't jump into AI because all you're doing is just, <laughs> you, you're still going to get a bunch of work requests, right? So uh, fair enough, Charles. I mean, I think, I think we all see that. And, and if we can develop that, uh, it's hugely important, of course. So, I mean, you say you can have vibration analysis and find a loose bolt, but you can also just go out and look at it to find it earlier, right? So yeah, the, you know, can, I think control systems can only tell you so much but if you go out and you walk around an area and you do it every day you will hear immediately if there's a different sound and you'll you'll immediately see a leak that you may not see in a control system so for me i agree but charles you have to get out there you have to walk the plant you have to know what it sounds like and what it looks like and feels like yeah and i think i want to comment on that and i think that's equally important for us managers to do because if we yeah. sit in our ivory towers and listen to with people and hear what other people are saying it's like the game when you whisper in the ear right and it goes around the circle and that word comes out another end it, you have to go and see firsthand if you're going to manage maintenance you can't listen to all these other people because everybody has their agenda you have to be out there on the floor see what's happening go out in the morning meeting you know look at a work order and say when they go to back to the same guy at 11 o'clock did you have the parts do you have a tool you know <laughs> what are we doing here yeah and if you're not out there you're going to miss it just like the but it's the same thing but it's on the management side mm. there's a question here from jerry clark uh what steps would you advise to change a maintenance organization culture from reactive to predictive and i'm, I'm imagining when you showed one of those plants there that was completely caked and it looked like fertilizer it looked like a wreck of a plant how do you start when you go into a place like that? Where do you start? Well, the, the true answer is the answer you don't want to have is, is of course it depends on the situation because no plant is the same, right? But I, I think one of the, uh, just to give you one pointer, if you don't have this, one thing that I've seen very effective is to start with priorities of work order together with operations to say, okay, what, what is really important? I can only do 12 work orders, you know? And, and how do we prioritize 
and which ones do we do first? Because you start cutting out work that don't need to be done by having that discussion with operations, having clear priority rules. Priority rules. So what is a priority one? If I'm going to drop my tools and go, it has to be safety, safety, uh, immediate safety risk, immediate environmental risk, or immediate risk for downtime or quality losses. Because none of those, I don't drop my tools, for example, and come and start working with those priorities. Because what you do is you start freeing up time. And then once you start freeing up time, maybe a little time to do some planning and then start doing it. And of course, it's quite futile unless uh, plant management decides to, because that pump I showed you, I mean, you have to replace it, right? I mean, if you're not willing to do that, so you have to talk to them about financial impact of that. Are you going to wait till it breaks down or are you just going to let it run to failure, yeah. right? Yeah. But I do think as we've been very successful. It's a little trick. You start with priorities and operations maintenance and start saying, look, we, we can't, maintenance can't just fix everything. You can't just market them. We have to start prioritizing and very strictly. And then we can be, then we can start becoming more organized on our side. But it is different for different plants. It's just a little tip that worked for us here and there. So, mm. Mark Crosby says, great presentation, Tor. Thank you for sharing. How often do you come across companies who have developed job plans and task lists for breakdown work activities? So they would be, you know, really well planned organizations. Um, I, I, it's, I see that quite a bit, actually, but it's, it's in very distinct industries. So very rarely in process industry, I see that. But I do see it, for example, in packaging side of an industry. So if you take a, a process line, but then when you have packaging, because you can stop and start very quickly. So in those kind of environments um, where you have um, packaging of whatever, maybe food packaging, or it can be like I said, that paper mill has a toilet rolls packaging, right? Very small equipment, but they have very typical failures. So they have the parts, the tools, they plan the job, they don't schedule it, but you see that they plan it. So they have everything ready. And when it, when it happens, they can change really quickly. It's not very common, but you do see it. But I think it's very industry specific where you can start and stop equipment very quick, quickly. That's why I see it. I haven't seen it much in, well, of course you see standard job plans for big process industry, but the more outage, okay, we stop the the line and now we have an eight hour job and we have a standard job right but i don't think that's what you're asking yeah no and i i've seen it myself in assembly line type of operations where they they knew if the, if there was a big enough breakdown that they could do other things on the line at different places so that what they did was they planned the preventive work and they left out all the spares and the work orders and the descriptions in boxes at different parts and if the line went down because it broke down would call in three or four other technicians and they'd race around to where they were supposed to go and like almost like Formula One changing the four tires. It was opportunity maintenance, they called it, and it worked really well because they get they got they didn't get a lot of opportunity to do preventive maintenance. So they used to do it in parallel with the corrective. Yeah. No, I think it's an excellent idea. It's just as long as you don't rely a hundred percent on it because then no, operations no. I see sometimes operations just saying, Oh, well you just do it whenever you have a chance to do it. Well, some things just have to be done when they have to be done, right? Yeah. Like, obviously. But Yes, but uh, we called one down do lists and they had uh, one down do list for each little area. And you have them, like you said, sometimes in supervisor's office, sometimes out by the line, you had boxes ready. So very effective actually. Okay. This is a question from Dan O'Gorman. Do you believe that acid tagging with barcodes combined with handhelds help the FM technicians be more productive when they can scan the tags to acquire the history and latest manufacturers bulletins and best practices? Um, um, so short answer is yes, of course, Dan. Um, and I, you know that technology, of course, is evolving every day, right? Now it's RF tags, this and that, and that. So the changes, but the idea, absolutely. What the only thing I would say is again. So let, let me take a quick example. You know, one company I work with, they completely focused. Actually, we're working with them again right now, and they're doing the same thing. They're completely focused on how can they get their inspection route into SAP, and they, they they're focusing probably ten guys in the company for this one plant. How do they get an SAP? And we have built then routes together in, in Excel and so forth. So we focus on the wrong thing, I think. So yes, it will become more effective. Of course, you need to get them an SAP. Another plant, what we did, we used to get a crass person. Who's you get, how fast can you start an, uh, an inspection? This is quite a few years ago, inspection program tour. I said, I can do it this afternoon. I said, really? Yeah, you mean you're one of your best crass people. Somebody's willing to do it. And we said, okay, let's start walking. We start walking the routes that afternoon. And we start walking. And we start doing inspections. We had an we had an infrared temperature gun. We had a stroboscope. We had uh, inspection mirrors, um, an SPM vibration meter or SKF, whatever you want to do. Flashlights, right? And we just went out and start doing routes. And then we did that. And then we documented the routes after. So I, my point here is, I think is 
of course it's, it's better, but I don't think you should get tangled up in it. Get people out inspecting and then you add on the technology because then you also get the right technology for your plant, what you need. So absolutely, I'm for technology, let's make it, but don't make it stop you from doing inspections, whatever you do. Yeah, okay, and Charles Smith just follows up there. He said, I agree, I've seen predictive maintenance and planned job procedures in both biologics, pharmaceuticals and medical devices. And he, he loved your talk. So thanks for that, okay. Charles. One question from myself, Tor, I know we're getting towards the end here, but in, in terms of maintenance and reliability, and it's, it's hugely important and operations and maintenance should work very closely together. But in the bigger picture, in the asset management world, when we look at and think about and talk about ISO 55000, have you come across much of that? Or, I mean, outside of regulated industries where they almost need to do that to get funding, why is the adoption of ISO outside of those industries in the 55,000? Why is it not as, as, as widespread as we would have thought? Um, I, I think it has to do with that it's not regulated by law, like you said, and, and people forced to do it because it is quite a bit of work to do it that way. Mm. So people just take pieces of it. I think if, like in the US, we have um, 5% of the population and 70% of all the lawyers, right? So if we get it, I said 55,000, I'm pretty sure it's going to come the lawyer way, not because the companies feel like they want to do it. It's going to be that way. And that's unfortunate because it gives you pretty good framework. I mean, you don't have to, you know, well, I mean, it's just a framework, right? Something to hang it on. It's like you, yeah. you, you buy a box, right? And, 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 and you can hang everything on it. So I, it, that's surprising that people don't go through it, but I think it's just it's like everything else is extra work and we're running around fixing failures. So, you know, yeah, I think it's very it good. On, it's very good on telling you, you know, what you need to do, but it doesn't really tell you how to do it. I think the right. that's where people struggle with it. They they can't uh, read through it and say, okay, this is now what I have to do. Here are the twenty things I need to do. It's very good at telling us uh, what to do, and I'm I'm waiting for someone to come up with um, the how. Yeah. No, it tells you that you need to have clear goals, and then it's like, okay, what does that mean? What kind of goal are you talking about? Are you talking about this little goal you're talking about, the overall goal, I mean, you know, it's, it's hard to put it in perspective, right? If you don't have that experience and haven't worked through it. So, um, and, but I, I think it's a very good framework to go through and it's not, you know, just reading through those in detail is quite helpful. So I would encourage anyone to do 55,000, 55,001 and two and read through it. I mean, it, it won't take you that long, It'll take you a couple of days, maybe at the most, uh, a couple hours a day, you know? Mm. Okay, so look, that that's all the questions uh, coming in at the moment to so I think we'll uh, draw a line in the sand and say uh, thanks very much for tonight and thank you for taking your time to talk to us this evening it was very good everybody got a lot out of it um, and we were delighted to have you back I remember we it's nearly 10 years maybe even more since you uh, gave us that workshop on reliability in the Aviva Stadium that went down very well and gave us the headline talk as well so thanks very much for that um, if anybody wants to talk to Tor, we, we will make the deck available afterwards. And of course, uh, ITCON Inc. is a, a well-known company, so don't hesitate to contact him if you want any follow-ups or you'd like to talk to him about anything else. I would recommend to anyone that's out there to take a look at the Meta Asset Management Association. They have events. It seems like it's about monthly. It's usually a presentation. It is 7, 8 o'clock Irish time, which would end up being about two two three in the afternoon depending on summertime winter time here in the us at least um and they have really good content so take a look at the meat asset management association perhaps become a member thank you <laughs>